Without further ado, please may I introduce to you a man that probably doesn't need an introduction, actually, Tim Laycock. He's the artistic director of the New Hardy Players. He's currently directing the Mayor of Casterbridge with Emma Hill. Some of you have been fortunate to see it already. It is outstanding. Uh, he, Emma Hill herself played Tess many times in their 2009 to 2010 production. And the Mayor of Casterbridge itself will be coming back to Dorchester, everybody, in December. But you'd better hurry up and book. They're almost all gone now as well. So in 2018 and 2019, Tim Laycock gave a series of performances of the story of Tess in the second study at Max Gate, surrounded by the illustrations from the serialisation of the novel. Stripped down to a bare narrative, the performance tells Tessa's story as it might be remembered by an old Marlott villager many years afterwards. It draws on the main events and episodes in Hardy's novel, including some of the local folk songs that are such a feature of Tess. Tess's experience with Alec mim mirrors the plotline of several ballads which were popular at the time in the Victorian countryside. Blackberry Fold and the Banks of Sweet Dundee are just two examples. So please put your hands together for Tim Laycock of the New Hardy Players. Hark, said the fair maid, the nightingale is singing. The larks, they are winging their notes up in the air. Small birds and turtle doves on every branch are singing. The sun is just a glimmering. Arise, my dear. That's Tess Derbyfield's song, that is. The maidens used to sing it at the May dance. And there's people in Marlott remember it to this day. And if you'd have heard it sung at Derryman Cricks that summer years are gone now, you'd have thought, but the prettiest sight in Dorset. It was when the cows wouldn't yield and the butter wouldn't churn and Dairyman Dick said, in his old superstitious way, it was because a maid was in love. And Tess blushed. And all the other milkmaids smiled because they knew she was in love with Angel Clare. Ah, but wait. I'm putting the cart before the horse. I'm putting Jack Derbyfield's wagon in front of Prince. That was Tess's happy time. First, for the once upon a time, we must go right back to the beginning to Marlott, Tess Derbyfield's home ground. She grew up in a tumble-down cottage with her mother and father and six brothers and sisters. Tess Derbyfield. She belonged out of doors. She was like a bird that could never be caged. Some said she was too handsome for her own good. And others said, well, they said she went from bad to worse. Mind you, it was all Parson Tringham's fault. If he hadn't filled old Jack Derbyfield's mind with antique nonsense about him being a sir and related to the famous Derbyville family with great coffins in the crypt at Kingsbeer Church and lands and houses and untold wealth and I don't know what else beside, none of this would have happened. But Jack's head was turned. His heart was bad. And he was never too fond of work at the best of times. He was rather too fond of Rolliver's Ale House. One night he got so tipsy he couldn't drive the cart to market. So Tess had to go, along with her younger brother Abraham. They harnessed up Prince, loaded up the cart and set off in the dark. All the stars were out. Did you say stars were worlds, Tess? 
Yes. All like ours? I think so. They sometimes seem to be like the apples on our stubborn tree. Most of them splendid, a few blighted. Which do we live on, a splendid one or a blighted one? A blighted one. How would it be if we'd pitched up on a sound one? Well, father wouldn't have coughed and creeped about like he does and wouldn't have got so tipsy that he couldn't go on a journey and mother wouldn't be always washing and never getting finished. And Tess, you would have been a rich lady ready-made and not have to be made rich by marrying a gentleman. Tess fell asleep at the reins and the wagon collided with the post van early in the morning and Prince was killed. Well, you can't be a carrier without a horse, and there was no money to buy another one, so there was nothing for it but to ask their newly discovered relations to help. Joan Durbeyfield dressed her eldest daughter up like a picture and sent her off to the Durbeville mansion at Trantridge to see if the rich relatives would give her a job. And secretly, She hoped that the rich cousin would fall in love with Tess and marry her. And then, just like the best fairy tales, they could all live happily ever after. Well, the rich cousin was attracted to Tess all right, but for the wrong reason. Alec d'Urberville was rich. He was privileged. He was used to getting exactly what he wanted. And when he saw Tess, it was her he wanted. So he appeared kindly and arranged for her to work for his mother. One of her jobs was to look after the birds in Mr. Durbeville's aviary. Tess, well, she needed the job, but she felt very uneasy and hated the attention he was giving her. She did her best to avoid him and discourage him, but one night, after the fair in Chaseborough, She nearly got into a fight, and Alec d'Urberville came along and swept her up onto his horse. Out of the fat, into the fire, out of the fat, into the fire, they called after her. And they were right. Alec rode off into the darkest part of the Cranbourne chase. And the long and short of it was, in the middle of the night, when Tess was exhausted and frightened and half asleep, He had what he wanted from her. I wish, I wish, but tis in vain. I wish I were a maid again. But a maid again I'll never be Till the apples grow on the orange tree. After that, Tess wouldn't stay at Trantridge a moment longer. D'Urberville rode after her and tried to persuade her to come back. But she despised him for what he'd done and turned her back on him. Tess went home. Joan was pleased to see her, but Tess had to tell her mother she'd left her job because she was pregnant. Tess, you ought to have been more careful if you didn't mean to get him to make you his wife. Mother, how could I be expected to know? I was a child when I left this house four months ago. Why didn't you tell me there was danger in menfolk? I thought if I spoke of his fond feelings and what they might lead to, you'd be hauntish, Wean, and lose your chance. Well, we must make the best of it, I suppose. Tis nature, after all, and what do please God... A few months later, Tess had Alec's child, a baby boy. She called him Sorrow. She baptised him herself with her brothers and sisters. But like many's another child back then, Sorrow died when he was only a few weeks old. The vicar refused to bury the child, so Tess had to do it herself at night. Sorrow was buried by lantern light, At the cost of a shilling and a pint of beer to the sexton, 
in that shabby corner of God's allotment where he lets the nettles grow. Tess made a little cross of two lathes and a piece of string, bound it with flowers and stuck it at the head of the grave. Arise, 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 pick your lava posy. It is the finest flower that ever my eyes did see. Yes, I will pick you roses, sweet lily pink and posies. So early in the morning, at the break of the day. A year or two later, Tess decided to make a fresh start. She left Marlott and went south to work for Dairyman Crick at Talbot Hayes Dairy. And there, surrounded by gentle people and cattle, Tess's life took a turn for the better. The dairyman and his wife were homely and kind, and she had good friends, Marion, Iz, and Retty. And the simplicity and regularity of the work was soothing. A young man called Angel Clare was working at the dairy, learning about agriculture. He was a parson's son, well brought up and educated. He was young, he was handsome, and being an angel, he played the harp. All the milkmaids were in love with him, and Tess was no different, and it wasn't long before Angel fell in love with her. Despite her past troubles, Tess was strong and healthy, and if anything, she was more beautiful than ever. All that summer they walked and talked, and pretty soon the walking and talking turned to courting, and despite his mother and father disapproving, Angel asked Tess to marry him. He loved her too much, really. She seemed to him the ideal of an innocent, perfect woman. Tess knew the reality was different. She tried to tell him about her past, but Angel wouldn't listen. So, at last, Tess agreed to marry him. She wrote to her mother straight away to tell her the good news, and soon got a letter back. Dear Tess... We are all glad to hear you're going to be married soon. But with respect to your question, Tess, I say between ourselves, quite private, but very strong, on no account say a word of your bygone trouble to him. I did not tell everything to your father from your affectionate mother, J. Derbyfield. Well, Tess being so truthful, she ignored her mother's advice. She felt she had to tell Angel about Alec and the baby. She wrote the whole story down in a letter and posted it under the door, but it went under the carpet, and Angel never found it. (coughs) So to church they went the very next day. They were married by asking, as I've heard say. And now this girl, she is his wife. She'll prove his comfort day and night. She will prove his comfort day and night. Well, that's how it would have been in a fairy tale. But Angel didn't want fuss, so they got married quietly by license. Tess, of course, thought Angel knew all about her past. On their wedding night, Angel confessed to Tess that he'd had an affair with a married woman. Tess was almost glad and told Angel all about her own experience, thinking he'd forgiven her. But that didn't happen. Not by a long shot. Back then, what was all right for a man wasn't all right for a woman. And instead of loving her for the beautiful, kind, thoughtful woman she was... Angel was instantly repelled by Tess. Forgive me as you were forgiven. I forgive you, Angel. Yes, you do. But you do not forgive me? Tess, forgiveness does not apply in this case. 
You, you were one person, and now you are another. Angel, don't laugh. I, I was a child. I was a child when it happened. I knew nothing of men. You were more sinned against than sinning. That I admit. Then you forgive me. I do forgive you, but forgiveness is not all. Do you love me? I'm going out. And he left her. He went away. He went a long way away to South America. Yes, he left that poor girl on her own. Da 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 Life for Tess got very difficult. She was weighed down with grief. She was too ashamed to go home. At last, she found work on a poor, starve-acre farm at Flint Camash. Well, the name tells you what the place was like, doesn't it? The field work was bitter and hard. Farmer Groby was harsh and cruel. In the middle of winter, weary from cutting swedes, Tess called in at a barn to listen to a travelling preacher. She stood at the door to listen and recognised the voice. It was Alec d'Urberville. He told her he'd renounced his bad old ways and turned to God. He begged her not to tempt him again. Tess, who never had such a thought in her head. But such was her beauty. Even dressed in shabby clothes with raw hands, she still stood out amongst every other woman and Alec started to pursue her again one day Tess's sister Liza Lou came to see her Tess you've got to come home mother's ill she's dying Tess made her way back to Marla only to find it was father not mother who had died and when Jack Derbyfield died the family was destitute the cottage was in his name and they had to leave. Alec d'Urberville offered to help, but Tess refused. She wrote to Angel in desperation, begging him to come back and help them, but she got no reply, and at last, when there was no other way forward, she accepted d'Urberville's help and his money. She went off to Sandbourne to live with Alec, and he had his bird in a cage at last. Yes, Tess did that, for her family. I wish I wish, but tis in vain. I wish I were a maid again, but a maid again I'll never be till the apples grow on the orange tree. Angel had plenty of time to think. When he received Tess's letter, he was full of remorse. And he set off for home. He came to look for her. At last he tracked her down. And when Tess came downstairs to open the door in her red dressing gown, for all the world like the kept woman that she was, that was the end of it. He was too late. Tess sent Angel away. Later that day, in her despair and her desperation, she killed Alec with a knife. The blood dripped through the ceiling, so they say, and the murder was quickly discovered. Tess ran away and searched till she found Angel. Together they went on the run. They came to an old ruined house in a forest just like you do in real fairy tales, and there they spent their happiest days. But it couldn't last. They had to move on, travelling at night, avoiding the highways. At last, they came to Stonehenge. Tess was exhausted. She lay down on a stone in the middle of the circle. Sleepy are you, my dear? I think you're lying on an altar. I like it very much here. It seems as if there were no folk in the world but we two. 
And I wish there were not, except Liza Lou. Angel, if anything happens to me, will you take care of Liza Lou for my sake? I will. Did they sacrifice to God here? No, it was to the sun. You see that stone set away by itself? The sun will presently rise behind it. Angel, do you think we shall meet again after we're dead? He couldn't answer. He kissed her, and she went to sleep. The sun rose. Dark figures surrounded them. Tess was taken away, tried for Alec's murder, found guilty, and condemned to death. When Tess was hung, they raised a black flag on the top of the jail to signify the completion of the execution. Two figures were watching on a hillside outside the city. One was Angel Clare, the other was Liza Lou. They bent themselves down to the earth as if in prayer and remained thus a long time, absolutely motionless. The flag continued to wave silently. As soon as they had strength, they arose, joined hands, and went on. Le Mady, oh, Le Mady, you are the finest creature. You are the finest flower that ever my eyes did see. I'll play for you a tune all on the pipes of ivory. So early in the morning at the break of the day. Thank you. It's a good story, isn't it? <laughs> Thank you very much. Thanks. I think you'll all agree that that was pretty amazingly brilliant. Thank you very much, Tim, again for coming to do that for us. We loved it. Thank you.